Hickok 45, guess what we're celebrating? The 80th anniversary of the 357 Magnum, and I am so proud and happy to do it because it's one of my very favorite cartridges. And it's the 4th of July weekend. So we're gonna do it right. <laughs> we might burn ourselves up, but we're gonna do it right. Yeah, look at that. Okay, <laughs> well, it's not night, it's not dark, or else we wouldn't be filming, right? But yes, it is the 80th anniversary of the 357 Magnum. There's a Model 19 right there. Is that a pretty thing or what? Let's go ahead and take a shot while the excitement is at its highest point here. Cool, cool. Let's shoot the cowboy while that's happening. Boom. <laughs> what do I shoot the dog? You really can't see it. <laughs> oh, there it is. I think. <laughs> oh, man, I got it. <laughs> Yeah, it is a celebration. Uh, 80 years with that cartridge that so many of us have enjoyed for so many decades. And some of you for maybe not decades, but for a few years, right? And uh, fireworks don't really do it justice. But we're going to do, we have our own fireworks. And in the form of some cartridges, quite a few of them if we need them. But yes, it is the 80th anniversary. We give or take a few months, or yeah, I don't know. You know, it, it came about in '34, I think, in the first gun firearm that, <laughs> that was uh, uh, released on the market. Uh, they didn't call it the Model 27 at the time. It was called the Registered Magnum from Smith and Wesson, but it was the Model 27. Okay, the Smith and Wesson Model 27, big in frame, 357 Magnum. I've had several of them, I don't happen to have one now, and uh, that's what kicked it all off. And uh, we're going to kick off some more shooting, because I've got a Ruger, I've got everything you can imagine, and, and ooh, look, a loaded gun. You know what, it'll need to be empty, won't it, fairly quickly here. And we want to uh, uh, thank another sponsor we have today for this video, and it's Liberty Safe. They have uh, delivered a huge chunk of steel with a door on it. Uh, actually, the safe house in Nashville delivered it and installed it. But uh, yes, we want to thank uh, and welcome uh, Liberty Safe as someone who is supporting the channel today, okay, in this video. So I don't know if you know about Liberty Safe. They make beautiful safes. They make big safes. They make great safes. They're, uh, they're phenomenal. And when, as I have been safe shopping and looking over the last year, uh, there's have been ones I've been looking at. So fortunately, they have uh, come on board to help us on a video or two. So we appreciate that. And if you're looking for a safe, you know, check them out. Uh, they're heavy, by the way. So you need to get somebody to help deliver it and install it for you. Uh, like the safe house in Nashville. Unless you live in Seattle, I don't think they deliver out there. So anyway, we, we appreciate them. And like I said, we are celebrating the uh, 357 Magnum. Uh, I'm proud to do it because it was one of the first cartridges that I used extensively in my shooting career uh, in my hobby I picked up this well not this one but a model 19 very early on 73 74 shot the fire out of it and thoroughly enjoyed it okay and I brought out some of the props here these are some of the jugs of ammo I've loaded these are some hundred these are actually some 38 super bullets but they work in, in 38 357 and these are designed 38 here. 158 grain on these. Those are, I think, 165. They're kind of a weird hybrid. I've talked about those before. Had a lot of those left over from when I quit shooting the 38 Super. But that's something I want to talk a little bit about, too. And got some factory ammo, some hot 357, some uh, 38 plus P here uh, from Federal. We're going to try all that, shoot that. And uh, I've got one firearm that doesn't belong, and that's one you're looking at. That's a 44 Magnum. The reason I have it out, I'll go ahead and show you since John's uh, focusing on it there. This is like the first uh, 357 Magnum, the Model 27 I was telling you about. It was this size, not necessarily that barrel, came in all barrel lengths, but it, it was the end frame. 
So without the barrel, it would have looked a lot like that. I've had several of them. The barrel on the 27, the 357, uh, slimmed down about right here. And it would slim down, it would be more narrow for the remainder of the barrel. And beautiful guns, just like this one, but in 357 Magnum. But big old guns, okay? Big old guns like this. Like I said, the first ones were called the registered Magnum. And uh, I'm not sure, a couple years, I don't know when they, they went to the, the model 27 designation, uh, but that's what a lot of you have seen probably. I think Smith & Wesson makes it again now, kind of in their classic series. So it's a big old in frame 357. The only weird thing about it now when you look at one of those, and one reason I don't have one, they're neat guns, they're kind of historic. The Model 28 was the same thing, I had one of those too, except in a, a, a lesser finish. It was designed for carry for highway patrolmen, it was called the highway patrolman, I think, in fact, uh, is that it's a big gun that just holds six rounds. You know, whereas now Smith makes, uh, I think, one or two of these things where it holds the end frame that holds eight rounds. You know, like, like this, this L frame holds seven 357s. So that's the thing. The steel has improved and the metallurgy and everything. And so now we can have a 357 Magnum that has, you know, more rounds in it and not be gigantic. So that's what you get with that. The, the L frame there is a 686. Okay. And let's shoot this before we gab too much. This is, I uh, had it loaded with some hot stuff here. Uh, this is, this is factory stuff in this one, this Ruger GP100, another very common 357 Magnum. And since we have some hot rounds, let's just blow some stuff up. I think most of the water might have leaked out of that thing. We'll find out. A lot of it did. It didn't leak out of that jug, though. Yeah, let's take out a two liter with it. Hmm, I'll be darned. You have to hit it, don't you? I should have put something besides blanks in here. Okay, what am I doing? Going high or going low? I might knock my sights off. I don't know, maybe I'm flinching. That's pretty funny, isn't it, that I actually missed that. Okay, let's try that again. I'm going to get some hot ammo and take a shot at it. This is not meant to be a big shooting exhibition. I wanted to give you some information as much as anything on this fine old cartridge, 1935. Been a while, about 80 years. Uh, let me shoot that plate and see what's going on here. Okay, let me get you right on. Okay, maybe it's going a little bit low. With really hot ammo, sometimes it'll shoot a little bit low. Let's empty the rest of those. Let's put a couple on this target. I've got some uh, key names on there you might recognize. Some of you do, some of you don't. <laughs> I think that was the last round, maybe. Click, yeah. Oh, nice. This is a very sweet shooter, this GP100, as is the Model 19, as you know. Now, the 357 comes in a lot of different, uh, wow, formats. Double action, single action, uh, big guns, smaller guns now, whereas it started out only in big guns, as I was discussing, uh, just in all sorts. And even in a semi-automatic, like that Coon in there, you've seen that in the video, and we still have that for a day or two, so... Throw it, put it on the table. We've got Dan Wesson there. We've got a Colt Trooper. We've got the 686. We've got an SP-101. We'll be doing more videos on. My Model 65 you've seen recently. And then you might have seen the Halls. This one was made in West Germany. This was Dad's firearm. This was his favorite uh, handgun of all time. And uh, it's a J.P. Siren son. Uh, halls, you know, known by all sorts of names. Fairly well made, just a big old single action in 357. I don't know how many rounds he put through that thing, but he loved that. He shot it all the time. So uh, that's pretty cool to have that. So I just got out all the 357s I own, except for one rifle, the Model 92. I didn't get it out. You've seen it. And then some of these are not necessarily mine. This will go back. The Kunan will go back, but most of them are. 
I even got this out, the Colt Navy, because it's a 38 caliber, basically, 36, same thing. You'll see why, you already know that, don't you? Goes back to Wild Bill Hickox, what he carried, what he was famous for, and the same caliber, basically, okay? We had, and one of the points I wanted to make was, and the reason I have that out here, the 38 caliber cartridge bullet is such a huge part of, of our shooting world and has been for so, so long. I mean, so has 44 and some others, but 38, which is really generally not 38, and very quickly, back in the earliest 38s, it was like a 22 uh, long rifle. It's a heel type bullet. You notice it's flush. The bullet is flush with the case. So if I put the micrometer on that thing, the calipers, and measure the diameter of the bullet in the case, it'd be about the same, wouldn't it? Whereas with any modern bullet, that's not the case, uh, no pun intended, your bullet sits down in the case, all right? So the diameter of the case on this 357 is going to be a good bit bigger than the actual bullet, where it's the same as it is the same on the 22, all right? And the early cartridges were heel type, like the 22, even the big ones, they were like that 22, and so they were a bigger diameter. So they might have been a 38. Okay, so that's why a 44 is not really a 44, it's a 43 and, you know, and all that. So, just want to remind you of that. We've talked about that before. Uh, so, that's why this is a 357 Magnum, 357 thousandths. That's where that comes from, which is what? That's almost 36 caliber, 358, 359, 360, 360 thousandths would be 36 caliber, right? I'm not a mathematician. So really, we're talking about a 36 caliber firearm, okay? And, and 38 Special, they're really 36s. Uh, 357, essentially it's a 36, like this. 36 caliber Navy Colt, okay? Uh, so just be aware of that. That's really what we're talking about, and that's where the, the and we just don't change the name. I think when Smith & Wesson made the first 38, uh, was it Long Colt? I don't know, I'll lose track of, of those, but, um, they wanted to keep the name 38 even though it wasn't 38 even when they started putting the bullets down in the cases it just sounded better and people were used to 38 so you know you just have to get by all that stuff so so really our world revolves around 36 caliber bullets in so many ways we call them 38s or 357 magnum or 357 maximum uh, 38 super nine millimeter that's why i have the nine millimeter round out here essentially the same thing it's 36 caliber i think the nines are generally 356 thousandths it's a 357 or 358 so it's the same thing though a 380 same a thing essentially okay so we're very uh, we're inundated as shooters with these same bullets 38 we call them they're not really 38 but a huge part of our sport okay similar essentially the same bullet just different cases and all that okay and like this 38 Super, these bullets I loaded in 38 Super cartridges for years. Had some left, I loaded them in 357. They shoot great. All right, so a little lesson there. I wanted to show you. So, let's, which one do you want me to load up and shoot? Let's shoot Dad's. Why the heck not here? Let's put some rounds in it. I can, I can go from any bucket here. I have loaded these things so many years, uh, starting in 73. I have no telling how many I have fired, especially back when the only centerfire handgun I had was a Model 19. Well, I went through a lot of those. Okay. Click. <laughs> well, you can barely feel it with that thing. It is so heavy. <laughs> You could shoot the hottest magnums out there in that and not even know it. And uh, now if you get a small 357 magnum, you will know it because it does have some recoil. Nice cartridge though. And uh, these are moderate, these ones I load. If I want really, really hot ones, I just shoot factory ammo. Yeah, that's just what I do. Okay. Uh, what else you see there that looks interesting to you? Anything? I'll tell you something you might not have known that uh, actual, actually General Patton carried a 357 Magnum. His had an ivory handle and three, three and a half inch barrel. I believe his was one of those they called the registered Magnum before it was known as the Model 27. So it was a big old gun like this, except with a short barrel. 
and I've, I've seen it, John and I have seen it in the Patton Museum up in Lexington uh, area. Well, not Lexington, over uh, south of Louisville, actually, the Patton Museum. Uh, he carried that thing. Uh, big names associated with the 38 357 Magnum would be, of course, who? Elmer Keith. He is uh, considered to be instrumental in the development of the cartridge. You know, we had the 38 Special, which came along around the turn of the century, 1898, 99, you know, 2000, or 1900. And uh, it had a bad, well, 38 Special didn't have necessarily a horrible reputation. The 38 Long Colt did. So the 38 Special was a little more powerful and very, very popular. And then Elmer Keith got to experimenting with it, and the people of Smith & Wesson, uh, Philip Sharp, who actually was with the NRA, but he's a technical guy. So there are two or three, four people involved in it, not just Elmer Keith, and the stories vary on that. But uh, Elmer Keith liked powerful handguns. And there was a model that Smith came out with called the 3844. It was a uh, 38, but it was it's special, 38 special, but it was on an end frame like this. And so it would handle some hot rounds. Now it wasn't a Model 27, this is pre all that. It was the gun they had been using for the 44. So it was a bigger gun with smaller holes in it so it had more strength. Well, Elmer and others got to messing with that and experimenting with some really hot 38 Special rounds. And that, that's what kind of was the genesis for all that. And uh, they finally came up with a round they liked with the 38 Specials, what, 800, 900 feet per second. They were experimenting with rounds getting up to you know, 13, 1500 feet per second. And I don't think they were able to blow up those uh, 38 to 44 guns, those bigger frame guns. And so that's what kind of started it. And then at the same time, the 38 Super came out. The FBI and police agencies were having trouble with these gangsters and the bad guys with, you know, competing against their 45s, their Tommy guns, and their bulletproof vests that the gangsters had, bulletproof windows even. And so the 38 Super was supposed to take care of a lot of that, but not a lot of agencies, you know, wanted a 1911 to carry. Smith & Wesson went the other route. They stuck with the revolver and experimented and came up with a 357 Magnum cartridge. A lot more velocity so that it would penetrate a lot of car doors, all those kinds of things that the police agencies especially wanted. Okay, it's kind of in a nutshell uh, part of what happened during that time period. So that was around 34, 35. So right in the middle of the Great Depression, here they come out with this gun that is, it, it was big. It was big, got a lot of publicity. And even though people didn't have a lot of money, I think they had a back order of about four years, I read. People wanted one. It was basically, at the time, the most powerful handgun ever made, at least production cartridge, 357 Magnum. And they, again, didn't, I don't think they called it even the 357 Magnum at the time, but uh, initially it was just like, it was just this really hot 38. And everybody wanted one, so they got them. Interesting gun, FBI carried them, and I think a three and a half inch barrel, very popular among police, and they, I'm talking about that specific gun, the, the Model 27, or the predecessor to it, same gun, okay? And then, uh, so it was very popular, almost 20 years later, you know, Bill Jordan of the Border Patrol, a famous gun writer and shooter, his ideal 357 Magnum was a bit smaller. He liked a K frame. He wanted something in a in a frame like this Model 19, and thought that would be the ideal police revolver. And as you know, that's a lot smaller. Isn't it? It's just you know a lot smaller <laughs> and handier. And his idea was this gun right here, basically a four inch K frame 357 Magnum. And so he experimented. He did a lot of those experiments and talked Smith and Wesson, among others, into to doing this and making a firearm that was smaller. And they had the metallurgy to do it too at that time. It didn't have to be a big end frame to withstand the pressures of the 357 Magnum. So they did, Smith & Wesson worked on that, tempering the steel to where it could uh, be downsized, uh, you know, so to speak, into a really handy revolver. Now we still think of this as a pretty big gun, but at the time it was not, considering it was firing the most powerful cartridge around, 357 Magnum. Okay, and so Bill Jordan is famous for, for that and, and shooting it, competing, and demonstrating how effective it was. He was a great shot and a well-known gun writer. And it is, to this day, it's still a very desirable firearm, isn't it? You know, the one that you see me bragging on, that Model 65 stainless gun, is the same gun, essentially, just a K-frame, 
357 Magnum. And it would fire 38s or 357. So that's the beauty of it. Yeah. So nice gun. And that's and that takes us into the era of say the 50s, 60s, 70s, and then these things were carried by you know state patrol, everybody else for years and years and years. There may still be somebody carrying them. I don't know. In fact, I like that so much I'm going to shoot it again. Let's try some 38s in it. And as I have pointed out many times to you all, that's the beauty of the 357 Magnum. There's nothing more versatile uh, that I can think of than one of these revolvers because you can shoot so many different types of rounds in it. Really powerful rounds. Uh, these things, uh, yeah, in fact, when Smith came out with a 357 Magnum, uh, I think it was it one Daniel Wesson, it was, uh, uh, I don't know, one of the Wessons. He was famous for hunting big game. He went out and killed about everything you can imagine with it in the, in the way of big game, just to prove how effective it was. Now, see if I can uh, do a little better here. Uh, I think so. <laughs> Try another two liter. Yeah, try the gong. Not sure whether it holds low or high. There we go. And let's put the last one on that target. Ooh, right in the blue, red. I mean, I think that was the end of them. Sure was. Really fun to shoot. Great gun, I tell you. And uh, let's put those in the other. And again, uh, Elmer Keith was you know involved and he was as he was in the 41 magnum and the 44 magnum and it is why is it so versatile why do people like it why does it just have a life that never ends the very things that i have talked about uh if you search our channel for anything 357 magnum you'll see me talking about some of these things probably two or three different times the fact that you can shoot some really warm rounds in it or light rounds or really light rounds like these these in fact this is what the first 38s kind of look like and these are 38 special just a lead bullet you know and uh, that's another thing when they came out with the early magnums they were still lead bullets they weren't jacketed they were swaged which is soft lead and so they did have some problem with leading when you increase your velocity to that point with lead bullets you can you can have some leading problem you know they were not there's no jacketed pistol rounds i guess uh, uh revolver rounds at least at that time hand loaders would use hard cast bullets and they didn't have as much problem that's what all these are that's all anybody uses now basically in a lead bullet hard cast but uh so when you increase velocity you're going to get some leading now these are very comfortable Go gong hunting again. <laughs> Go cowboy hunting. Click. <laughs> Sweet. 158 green round those. Nice. Fun to shoot. So that was that one. Uh, what else was I going to make up about this thing? Oh, a quick, just a quick overview. Again, this is a, a single action. Uh, gosh, Dad bought that back in the 70s when I got him into He was always a shooter, but not as crazy about it until I got him into it even bigger. And he started hand loading uh, 357 Magnums and everything and shot that thing a lot. This is a Ruger GP100 you've seen before, three incher. I know they're really fine, even though I was struggling there for some reason. Uh, a very fine revolver. Model 13, uh, you've got there is a uh, 357 Magnum, of course, that's why it's on the table. And that's the FBI gun in a three inch barrel and a round butt, which that one doesn't have, like my Model 65 there. And you got the 686 on the other side of it there, one of my favorite three inch uh, models you saw. And then the SP-101, I've shot a little bit, we'll shoot some more. We got the Kunin. Uh, which you saw in the video and you, this Dan Wesson and that trooper. Hopefully you saw those videos Hopefully you've seen the Navy cold again. I explain why I have it out here. It's a 36 caliber just like everything else on the table <laughs> And then that's a 44. That's the oddball, but that's the end frame I just wanted to bring one of the end frames out. We've got several This one's blue the only blue end frame. I guess I have so that would be more like what the, the first uh, Model 27s look like Okay so, uh, what was I going to say here to confuse you? Uh, again, it's, it's, 
you can't hate the 38, the 38 or the 357. It's in the middle ground. Uh, it gets ridiculed, of course, because it's not some gigantic you know, 50 cal or it's not a 44 Magnum and all that sort of thing. But from a defensive standpoint, actually a 38 Special has been better than most people want to give it credit for. And then, of course, a 357 Magnum is considered by many really savvy, intelligent, uh, learned uh, gun writers and, and shooting uh, experts considered to be possibly the best handgun cartridge. Okay, not just a good one, but one of the very best, particularly in a 125 grain, very fast hollow point. Uh, it, it has one of the best records in terms of, oh, here we go, that, that stopping power, you know, phrase, which you hate to even use, but it's an extremely effective round. It's also extremely loud. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put some 38 Specials in. Which one was I having the trouble with? This one? Yeah, the GP100. This firearm, uh, this thing is scary sometimes when I bring it out here and shoot it. Uh, not long ago I brought it out and was shooting it some, and it was, I just couldn't miss, really. That's what's ironic about my missing there a minute ago. I, I guess it was a different uh, impact of those hotter rounds or something. I'm going to shoot one of those plates and hold it right in the middle. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm pulling left a little today on this one. All right, got Mr. Gong. Yeah, nice gun. Let's go cowboy hunting. Sweet. 38 special. Okay. Go step it. All right. So, Bill Jordan. Uh, the Combat Magnum, this was called the Combat Magnum. Then when they started using model numbers, it was the Model 19. If it's in stainless, what model is it? Model 66. Yeah, many of you probably have one of those. Some of you do. And one of the reasons I was so uh, interested in, in doing this and you know doing a little tribute to this car cartridge, but one thing, it's the 80th anniversary. When it comes around to the 100th, I might not be around. So, you know, John will have to do that one. But, uh, it also because so many people seem to be enjoying revolvers these days. There, there's a resurgence of interest in revolvers, and it just doesn't get much better than a 357 38 Special. And I've always leaned towards the 357. I have a couple of 38 Specials, but it's mainly for the size or the, an old classic Model 10, that sort of thing, because I hand load, and I can load a 357 wherever I want it where it's kind of a just a warm 350 or 38 special or light magnum and so i just have one cartridge to think of so you know it's like why not if i have a 38 it won't feed a 357 magnum you know and which it shouldn't you know because that it could blow up the gun you know? uh but with the 357 you can use all this ammo all this 38 caliber ammo 36 caliber ammo right <laughs> hope you're not confused by that 36 caliber business but i mean 357 it's right there in the name okay what's that tell you so lots of cool guns in 357 and uh you know the history i mean man the 38 cartridge you know there's not much difference the uh the 357 is let me grab one it's i think uh it's either an eighth of an inch or a tenth of an inch longer that's so you can't put it in an old 38 uh revolver you know because it's going to be more powerful and you know it could be too much pressure for a 38 special in fact it would be if it's a hot round so what they did was they lengthened the case not really necessarily so you could get more powder in it because you can load these up the same pressures really uh, but so that they don't get stuck in a 38 special revolver that's the reason for that just like 44 mag and 44 special i know i'm talking fast i, was, I wanted to wanted to get a lot of this out uh you know for those especially new shooters that know a little bit about 357 but maybe don't know as much about the history of it so it goes back to 35, basically, in general thing, 1935. That's when uh, they stretched out this case to a 357 length and made the, you know, it wasn't called that when it was first made, the Model 27 from Smith and Wesson. And, uh, and then in the 50s, scaled that rascal down a little bit into a K-frame and made it a much nicer packing firearm, all right? And now they're available 
And, 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 and then in the 50s, I guess it was, is when uh, Colt made the Python. They're obviously, everybody has a 357, 38 Special. The, uh, the Python, one of the most beautiful 357s out there. And so it's not just a Smith & Wesson thing, it's, it's a Ruger, we've got a Kunan on the table, we've got a, a Colt there and the Dan Wesson. We even have a J.P. Sauron son from Halls. Colt, of course, chambered the uh, Colt single action in it, you know, in the 50s when they did that, I think. So Ruger makes a bunch of them in uh, the Blackhawks and uh, single action revolvers. Dad had one of those too, and uh, he liked it quite a bit. So, very, very popular cartridge. Can I shoot just a couple more? Let me, uh, let me try this again. Yeah, this is a nice guy. You know what I was gonna do though? Oh, I know what I was gonna do. I'm gonna put some hot rounds in here, and I just wanna shoot that cinder block. How's that? Y'all don't mind, do you? 357 Magnum. Didn't bring any my speed loaders out. Like I said before, I'm not interested in speed loading, really. The cool thing about a revolver is just how it loads how it works, how it operates, the simplicity of it, the fun of it. Uh, your magazine is difficult to lose. It's always there. <laughs> All right, get my ears on tight. All right. You can see it will work on a cinder block, even though it's a little measly 38, 36 caliber cartridge. Okay. And I don't know what else I can tell you other than I've enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I, I feel like it needs to be honored because so many people have. Uh, so many of you, uh, you have enjoyed the 357 Magnum for years. Uh, some of you as long as I have for longer and uh, you just you just have a special place in your heart for the 357 Magnum. Like me, you might not always fire the hot 357 Magnums in your 357 Magnum pistols, revolvers. You probably fire a lot of 38s, just like I do, or moderately loaded 357s, but I'm sure everybody that has one enjoys it. And if you don't have a revolver yet, it's hard to go wrong with one of these as your first revolver, unless you're just looking for a little pocket gun, you want a 38 Special. Uh, hard to beat a mid-size 357 you can shoot so many different things in it and you can use it for defense you can enjoy it at the range you can even hunt with it it's just an incredibly versatile uh, firearm like I said when I bought that one in a press I, I, I bought a press one day and the dies and everything I remember vividly uh, in Franklin Tennessee Battleground Armory it's not there any longer bought the RCBS Jr. 357 dies some brass everything I needed went home and started loading bullets. And then I'd go shoot at the city dump kind of place, go back, reload them, go back and shoot. Now it was just a process and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it uh, immensely. Of course, the L-frame, I didn't talk about much. They came out a little bit later because if you're gonna shoot a steady diet of really hot rounds in, a, in one of these K-frames, you might want an L-frame. They're built a little bit uh, heavier, a little sturdier, just like the Ruger, okay? And I never did have any trouble with my, uh, my K-frames, though. Uh, they did just fine. So a great cartridge, uh, lots of history, going back into the various 38 caliber handguns uh, and cartridges out there. And just, just something that no shooting enthusiast really should be without. You should have one in your safe, right? You really should. So again, Appreciate Liberty Safe helping to sponsor this video. Appreciate you coming by. I'm glad you were in the neighborhood because it's a nice evening. And just to kind of hear a little babbling about the, one of my very favorite cartridges. Life is good. Hi, I'm Zeke with the Sonoran Desert Institute. And here at SDI, we're extremely proud to be sponsors of the Hickok 45 channel. You may be asking yourself, well, what is SDI? SDI is an affordable, fully accredited distance learning education program. We have an emphasis in gunsmithing and firearms technology. If you decide to become a gunsmith, you'll need to learn proper gunsmithing techniques. And while some people will use an apprenticeship program to gain these techniques, a formal education will ensure an organized, more comprehensive learning environment. But when you choose a gunsmithing school, 
still kind of difficult. So it's very important that you choose a gunsmithing school that meet the following criteria. First, look for a nationally or regionally accredited program. And whether distance learning online or through a brick and mortar ground program, a gunsmithing program should always have a hands-on element. And finally, make sure you look for a school with high student satisfaction. Find reviews online, check out its Facebook or other social media, or get on the same social media sites, find some alumni, and ask to speak with them about their experience. And while we're not at SDI today, I do have some of the firearms I've learned to work on and built myself through the SDI program. So let's go take a look at them. Okay, maybe not, we'll just get, seriously, can I not get a chair that fits me? I'm a big guy, dude. So, I guess, back to what we were originally talking about. Above all else, find the school that's right for you. It's not always gonna be the distance education programs or the brick and mortar ground schools that are for everybody. Just make sure you do your research on multiple options before you make that decision. But if you want more information on our gunsmithing school, just go to www.sdi.edu or call us at 1-800-336-8939.